I operate very well on low repetitions. It's worked well for me. I have really good form on most of my exercises, so I have no fear of damaging anything. And, and literally, Lawrence, to be honest with you, I walk around here today, I have no injuries. My rotator cuffs are super strong. My knees are great. My lower back is great. But I do take care of those things. Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. This episode is brought to you by the Resistance Exercise Conference, the science and application of strength training for health and human performance. Would you like to learn from the top strength training researchers, network and connect with other exercise professionals from all over the world, join a welcome reception on a Friday night to build relationships with other strength training professionals, experience an early morning workout from an expert trainer to kickstart your Saturday and get inspired, rejuvenated and focused on your strength training business? I certainly do and that is why I am attending and interviewing all of the speakers at the event. The Resistance Exercise Conference will be held on the 9th and 10th of March 2018 in Minneapolis, Minnesota at the Commons Hotel. To get 10% off your entry fee, head on over to resistanceexerciseconference.com, click the registration button and enter Corporate Warrior 10 in the promo code field in PayPal. I'm very excited about this and I've wanted to attend for years. Sign up now at resistanceexerciseconference.com and get 10% off with promo code CORPORATEWARRIOR10 and I look forward to meeting you in person. Hi guys, I am Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior, the podcast that teaches you how to optimize your health, exercise, business and lifestyle. My former guests include people like paleo pioneers, Mark Sisson and Rob Wolf, high intensity strength training experts like Dr. Doug McGuff and Drew Bay, successful entrepreneurs like Luke Carlson and Noah Kagan, and many, many more. Today's guest is Mr. America John Hart. John is a lifelong athlete, professional bodybuilder, and in 2013 became the oldest Mr. America of all time at age 48. In addition, John was the INBF Mr. America 2012 light heavy winner and natural Mr. Universe 2001 tall class winner. John has been training people for many, many years successfully using high intensity training based principles. I really wanted to get focused on this episode. So John and I almost completely focus on the training protocol and schedule he used pre bodybuilding contest. So panning out kind of 12 six and three months out from the contest exactly what his protocol looked like so we dig into all the detail including exercises sets reps volume etc so exactly what he did to win mr america in 2013 in addition we cover electronic muscle stimulation john's thoughts on the importance of progressive overload and what he's changed his mind about in terms of his approach to training as an older bodybuilding competitor for all of the show notes and links for this episode and all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.org. Don't forget to hang around at the end for your free gift. And now I give you Mr. America, John Hart. John, welcome to Corporate Warrior. It's an absolute honor to have you on the show. Wow. Thank you, Lawrence. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And uh, I really appreciate you and, uh, and the time you've taken to, to do this with me. Thank right. you. No problem. That sounded really genuine. <laughs> well, I am. No. I'm trying to be. No, 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 no. I, I don't actually. I'm not trying to be. I'm just doing me. That's all. <laughs> no, it's 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 good. It's good. Um, I as we were talking before, um, you know, I I done some I done some research. I'd polled my own listeners to get some questions for you. Um, I'd seen the interviews that NorCal Strength Studio had done with you, those interviews. And I'm like, damn it, Patrick, you're asking all my questions. <laughs> but but it's it's good because uh, he's making me be better and uh, giving me some more, uh, m- more of questions that have kind of spawned out of that, which I wanted to ask you. Um, and what I want to start with is really talk about um, your Mr. America contest prep. You, you, you know, mm. you your, your uh, success when you won the Mr. America when you were 48 um, was quite inspiring and your physique is, is really impressive. Um, I'd love to dig into, because I've never, I've never competed in a, in a physique contest, and I'd love to hear you talk about what the preparation looks like, firstly from a training perspective, 12, 6 and 3 months out from a competition. 
Yes. Oh, wow. That's, that's a loaded question right there. <laughs> I know. <laughs> just, I'm just, terrible with my long questions. Man, you added several levels to it. So if I, if I get lost along the way, you're going to have to you know, bring me back a little bit on part <laughs> of it. But, uh, yeah, uh, here we go. So uh, training for the Mr. America uh, and, and even contest prep in general. Okay. Uh, at my stage, at that point in time, I'm now 53. So at that point in time, when I was 48, I was, you know, not in my twenties, obviously. Okay. So what that does is it automatically sets it up so that men and women in general, when they are a little bit more advanced, okay, in the years, so they're not in their twenties and not in their early thirties, we have to be a little bit more conscious of maintaining a decent and controlled amount of body fat throughout the years. So that's the first part. Okay. So we're not, we're not talking about starting out fat. Okay. The skin will not come in nice if that were the case. So I'm going to give you a nice general start to the, to the answer to the questions. And that is we start from a good position. Okay. That's the first thing, Lawrence, is that we want to be fairly lean to start. Okay. And that was a very, very much for me a concern at the beginning was just, I wanted to make sure to have youthful looking skin, tight looking skin. In the end, I had to carry minimal amounts of body fat, you know, during the year in the first place. So I was already within 10 pounds of contest shape. Okay. At at the beginning at 12 months out. So to answer the first part of the question at 12 months out, the typical prep at this stage, and I'm going to give you both cases, but at this stage for a 48 year old, male, uh, who was never really grotesquely fat or morbidly obese in the first place is to be within, let's say 10 to 15 pounds. I don't know the conversion in stone. You guys are going to have to do that one yourself. <laughs> okay. I know we're across the pond here. <laughs> no, it's okay. Everyone who listens to this is in your side of the pond anyway. So don't worry. <laughs> oh, good. All right. Okay. So, so really the first part is, is to be within 10 or 15 pounds of the desired contest weight and just have an idea of where that's at. I'm not a big scale guy as far as my, uh, as far as I go myself, but I go by the look. Okay. So I knew I was already in fairly good shape at 12 months out for somebody who's younger. They can bump it up a little bit more. I I believe a little bit more body fat and another five pounds is no big deal. Uh, easy to burn off when they're in their twenties, early thirties. So maybe at max 20 pounds above whatever their contest weight is, depending on their height, taller they are, the more can be shorter they are the less that should be. And then, uh, so I start my year off fairly lean, not super lean, and I'm not being super tight with that diet. Okay. But you're right at 12 months, six months, three months, when we get to that six month mark, you know, that, that, you know, the switch gets flipped. Okay. It's mainly diet wise, my training and the training of anybody who I've, I've helped in any way, shape or form is of a high intensity nature. And so, uh, that's pretty much year round, um, at least training to, to failure, uh, with the weights and, um, I'm a bodybuilder at heart and I've been for my entire adult life and mostly what I've known is barbells, dumbbells, and yeah, the, the good machines that have been out there. So when it comes to the training, number one, the training is of a high intensity nature, uh, still and minimal volume. When I hit that six month mark, I'm no longer playing around with cycling. And yes, I do involve certain forms of periodization in my training and that's coming. I'm writing a new book right now. You guys are going to have to wait on that. Okay. (laughs) So that's coming. Okay. So I will get in more detail on that in the near future. If you ever have me back, I'm sure it'll be up by then. But for now, uh, what I do is, is the training at six months out becomes way more intense. And if, if only, from a psychological point of view, I'm highly motivated at that point. So, uh, the workouts are brief. They're a couple of times a week, you know, at, at, at most I do full two, two normal workouts, full sessions, meaning I usually do an upper body workout, a lower body workout. And then if there's any little things, the forearms, the calves, the abdominals, you know, that as a competitive bodybuilder, you do have to have that, you know, attention to that concern for, and if they don't fit exactly in my other workouts, then I will take a third minimal, you know, 15 minute blast through it really quick type of workout to get those things touched up 
Just to clarify those those other two workouts you mentioned, is that a yes. split or is that a full body both times? Mm-mm. That is a that is a split, and you know, my history goes back all the way originally to the Mike Menser type training, uh, heavy duty. And uh, I was and have been an advocate for it, you know, my entire adult life. But in in truth, uh, the format that I do use is a form of one of his routines, the ideal routine. You can go and look those, those up, you know, through his website. But uh, it I'd is love, a form of I'd love of to it. hear you actually talk about, if you, if you remember, the actual protocol. So the specific exercises, the the whether it was single set to failure, rest oh, periods, yes. all of that stuff. If you if you are able to remember and recall that, that oh, would be I, interesting. <laughs> For those that the, don't the, have the, you know, don't rather hear sure. about it, you know? Sure. Honestly, uh, I, I do remember, actually. It was a quite a significant you know, time period in my life. So, uh, I was pretty obsessed and not quite balanced. Actually, uh, the title of Mr. America to me, I, I have such reverence, you know, for all of the men who in the past had competed in it, it was that meaningful to me. So, uh, and respect for it and for them. So I treated it the same way and it was highly memorable for me the entire time period. So I don't even have notes in front of me. I, I could find my notebooks on my training books, training logs and all that, but I don't even need to. I already know. Uh, yes, at six months out, I was pulling out all the stops, uh, kicking out the jams. I was uh, essentially, I would go in phases. I would start off with using a typical pre-exhaust type of uh, workout, which is very much uh, similar to what Mike Menser had described in his in his heavy duty to uh, mind and body. And that was a, his ideal routine similar to that, meaning it's not exact. It's personalized to me and myself and my training. And I have a training partner and my training partner does what I do. That's our arrangement. He's a former client. He's very intense and he's also Mr. Dependable. So that's the kind of training partner that I need. <laughs> it's somebody who's going to do what I do, right? So we go and those workouts start off pre-exhaust. The kind of split that I would do is in general, because I was emphasizing on my body, the shoulders and arms needed a little bit more attention as opposed to the chest and the back. When I would focus more on an upper body workout, my upper body workout would mainly be a shoulder and an arm workout with compound movements such as a close grip bench press. So I would tap my pecs I would use under grip pull downs. So that would tap not only my biceps when I would do the pull downs, but it would also use my lats. So I would tap my lats as well. So during those weeks, sometimes I would do, uh, I would do an upper body, call it an AB split, right? AB, upper, lower, upper, lower, week to week. Okay. But I would have an A1 and an A2, two different upper body workouts. The A1 would be my focus, shoulders and arms. Now that workout, I would do it each week. So I'm going to focus only on my A workout for now. I would do an A workout each week. Okay. That A workout would be A1, shoulders and arms. Now, because I was emphasizing it and not afraid of my chest or back, you know, atrophying, which it wouldn't, I would go ahead and I would usually do two weeks in a row of that A1 workout where I would train my shoulders and my arms. And specifically the exercises, uh, I do do dumbbell over, I, I generally started off with dumbbell overhead presses, and then I would go and I would do uh, some form of uh, dumbbell side lateral, any form, cable side lateral, ISO side lateral, but I would go immediately from that to some sort of an, a wide grip up or upright row just halfway up to my chest. So I was pre-exhausting my delts and then using my arms to push my delts a little bit further. I was still doing that basic dumbbell overhead press first, but then I would follow it up with a superset of some form of lateral raise standing or leaning slightly into a bench immediately followed by a wide grip upright row, just halfway up my chest. I wouldn't go all the way up. The rotator cuffs generally don't like that. And then I would follow that up with uh, either a bent over dumbbell lateral. That happens to be my favorite of all time, or I would use a good rear delt machine if I was in the gym as opposed to my garage. I have a, a two car garage that's loaded with some basic equipment, mainly barbells and dumbbells and benches and squat rack. So that would be my shoulder workout. And then I would immediately go into a bicep workout. Now I would do that single set 
to failure. And initially, Lawrence, when I would start that first at the beginning of the six month period, those first few weeks were just simply to failure, positive failure, where my training partner would ensure with a forced rep that I got it. I did it. It was single set to failure. Okay. And that's all I would do quickly. I would move quickly. He would move quickly. We move on to the next exercise or grouping of exercise. So already I have one pre-exhaust in on my shoulder workout. I would jump to my bicep workout and I would do my personal favorite I would do cable preacher curls, really isolates my biceps, leaves my my shoulders, everything else, my forearms out of the movement. I have to really, really dig in on my biceps to get the right feel for it. So I would do cable preacher curls, single set to positive failure. And how many repetitions I would do on that? I would do eight to 10, uh, eight to 12. I apologize. Eight to 12 or six to 10, depending on where I was at that far out at six months, I'm more of a six to 10 guy. Okay. As the contest gets closer, I might go a few reps higher simply because the heavy, heavy weights at that point, they generally don't feel so good as I'm ultra lean. Mm. You see what I mean? Mm. Yeah. So the, the leaner you get, it seems like there's less body fat, you know, between those muscle cells. So it, it, it does feel <laughs> like there's yeah. less cushion, less cushion for the pushing, the whole thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> interesting use of that uh, expression <laughs> yes, exactly exactly i'm just playing around but uh, yes i would do an isolation exercise when i do pre-exhaust it is pre it's not post-exhaust so i take an isolation exercise followed by a compound movement and i would go and i would do and i did do that preacher curl with a cable and i would set it up so that i get a lot of resistance in the peak contraction position so i have to move the preacher curl away from the cable far enough and, and, you know, you guys, you'll know what I mean when you do that. A lot of contraction uh, resistance near the top. That's what I like. And then I would immediately drop that cable once I hit failure between 6 and 10 if it's six months out. And I jump up to that chinning bar with a fairly c- close grip. And I pull myself up with everything that I have. And that could be anywhere from, you know, three to five repetitions in that zone. And I would have my training partner again from the ankles. Just give me one pure repetition. I'll add one, one pure forced repetition, I should say. I'll add that I'm not a big cadence guy. I, I, if you've seen any of my interviews, you understand that I, I, I loathe the, the artificially slow movements, artificially slow. It's just not my thing. And you can check anything. I don't, I won't go deep into that because that doesn't have to do with the question you asked, but, uh, I'm not a super cadence guy. I like the old Nautilus formula of two up, four down, and I generally stick in that range. Okay. Uh, if there's a peak contraction involved where there's resistance, I will stop right there and really squeeze the heck out of it. Okay. And then on those chin ups, once I'm done with that to positive failure, I'm off. My partner went. Boom. We're done with that. We move on to our triceps, which got a little bit of rest after that shoulder work earlier on. And again, it's pre exhaust. I do do uh, tricep press downs. And, uh, and back then I learned that I really never liked that movement using a bar, a short bar, an angle bar, any kind of bar. I hate it. I like using the free motion cable and taking the handles and making them parallel towards each other. And I do that with two different handles and using two different weight stacks, obviously on a free motion machine, it's an isolateral movement, but they're doing, they're done bilaterally at the same time. I drive that weight down alongside my thighs as I step back from the machine a little bit. And that during that time period, that's really when I discovered it during training for the Mr. America. It was a lot of fun to feel my triceps for the first time without cheating it, throwing my chest forward, all of that. So I really enjoy that movement even to this day. So tricep press downs again, six to 10 repetitions. If it's six months out for the show, if it's closer to the show, eight to 12 repetitions. And then I would immediately take that to failure and immediately, immediately jump onto either a close grip bench press with an easy curl bar or pullover presses with that same easy curl bar where I can actually handle 
more weight. I know that's the one exercise. A lot of people fear that one. They all think of Dorian and how he tore up his tricep years ago. Dorian Yates, that is, doing pullover presses. But again, I've done them, you know, for 36 years. I love them. I feel them fantastically in my tricep. And I I have never really overloaded them to the point where danger occurred. And my shoulders have great flexibility. So I enjoy that. So I would do that exercise for three to five repetitions immediately following uh, the press down on the free motion machine. And again, it's a positive failure to where my partner would go with me for one repetition just to ensure that I hit that failure. So at six months out, that was the type of training that I would do. As I would approach closer month by month, I would end up getting to the point where I would throw in more high intensity techniques. I'm still far enough out from that Mr. America, you know, at four or five months, I can throw in things like, you know, rest, pause repetitions. Uh, so it's not just pre-exhaust. If I'm going to use one of those other techniques, then we'll bypass the pre-exhaust. So I start to gradually, I dropped off the pre-exhaust as we would get closer and closer to three months. And I would throw in much higher int- intensity techniques that would hit the deep fibers. I didn't want to lose the deep fibers, Lawrence. I didn't want to sacrifice muscle, you know, as I was dieting. So as I would diet, yes, I'm going to get there in a second. Okay. As I was dieting, those calories would get low and I didn't in under any circumstance want to sacrifice any muscle that I worked hard for. So if anything, I wanted to stimulate more and I'm a big believer. You can stimulate more. So, uh, I would use some higher intensity techniques like partial repetitions with very heavy weights. I would do, uh, you know, rest pause repetitions. That's, you know, one repetition at a time, a complete maximum repetition followed by 15 seconds rest and then go ahead and jump on again for another maximum repetition and do that four or five times to the point where, again, my partner's helping me near the end. So these were ways and then negatives. Of course, I would use negatives, uh, which are very, very intense. And, you know, when I used any of those techniques, I would drop the pre-exhaust. I would also drop the volume usually uh, by dropping one or two exercises in each workout. That's just a physiological fact. The more intense you get, the less volume you're going to be able to handle either. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just wanted to um, ask you something. I, I want to let you continue because this is excellent. And I love hearing about all the details. Um there's so, so some research came out to show that, um, or that suggested that advanced techniques didn't reap any greater gains over just going to like concentric failure. I'm, I'm interested. So it, it, in spite of that, you still feel like, no, there is, there is utility to some of these exercises. H- have you, have you read any of that at all or, or do you just not, not need to? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I haven't recently, I haven't recently seen the study that you're, that you're talking about. I have not seen the recent one. Okay. I do know the kind of damage that can be caused, you know, deep down on a cellular level. Uh, you know, I've referenced it somewhere before. If they, if you search online on Google, I guess, uh, John Hart and negatives and things like that, you'll, you might find it somewhere out there where I, I actually named the study, which I can't pull up off the top of my head right now, going way back to like the nineties. <laughs> and they, yeah, and they did, they literally did, uh, a, a CAT scan or MRI studies on the muscle cells showing the kind of damage that was caused by, uh, you know, three sets of 10 negatives. Now, when I say three sets of 10 negatives, they trained one bicep with three sets of 10 negatives and the other one with three sets of 10 to positive failure. Now you and I both know three sets of negatives. Now, my God, I mean, that's massive. That's a massive amount, right? It's crazy. Of, mm. Yeah, it's crazy. When I say I used negatives, uh, I mean specifically that I would do, uh, as I said, I cut down that volume, right? So the volume is not just cutting out an exercise. The volume may be cutting out a certain number of repetitions. So going and doing a set of negatives, I'm using negatives as the example, because that's possibly the most extreme, ne- near the most extreme that I could think of. Okay. I'm, I'm using a weight at that point. I would use a weight that would be 50 or 60% heavier than I could have ever lift for 10 repetitions. Okay. And using a weight like that and just doing instead of 10 repetitions, just doing three or four 
negatives, where that first repetition would last 10 seconds. The second one would last nine seconds. The third one would be down at, you know, six. And the fourth one would be just outright dangerous to where my partner would have to have his hands right underneath it, right? Ready to take it, that type of thing and protect me. So in essence, I'm saying, I do believe that they, they have an application. I do believe that you have to be well rested. I do believe that uh, that you can probably make at the same time, I do believe you can probably make similar gains training to only positive failure and doing so, you know, uh, or even maybe even a repetition shy of, of, of positive failure. I mean, there's sacrilege right there for the high intensity community. Right. But yeah, uh, even training that close to failure, right. Uh, you could, I, I think you can, you know, make great progress. But I'm speaking solely within the context of your question, which was pre-contest. Mm. Now what's happening at pre-contest? I have limited energy at that point. It's, it's, imagine that it's six months out from the show. I've already kicked in a diet, which I was going to jump into in a minute. And the diet is already starting to strip away some body fat. I'm at that point. Boy, I'm not going to take a chance, Lawrence. I'm not going to take the chance. You see, I, I just can't take that chance. That okay. I'd love to see the study done on on the natural bodybuilder, right, or a group of natural bodybuilders using those kinds of techniques versus ones that don't. And then let's see exactly how much lean mass they maintained or gained versus the ones that didn't. So within that context of the question, I, I can't compare it. Uh, well, I actually can say I do believe. Two guys are just the same person in their off season. If they're not competing, just take an individual and have them trained to positive failure and they're well rested and they're eating calories nicely versus when they want to use higher intensity techniques that I just mentioned. Would there be a major difference? Well, I would question that one. I'd probably say, mm, maybe not, you know, but when we get down to it, and using those techniques the way that I just mentioned, which is, man, limited energy, you don't feel like training. As a matter of fact, I could tell you one of the things I hated doing was, you know, doing, I'd, I'd force myself to do my squats and, and do, you know, 12, 15 repetitions. I mean, to me, that was probably the hardest thing of my entire week of training or two weeks of training would be putting a barbell on my back and squatting for 12 or 15 repetitions with limited energy. Like, man, I mean, I, I, I'm not being lazy about it, but I'm saying, dang, everything after those first four, five, eight repetitions just felt like, wow, you just, you're sucking the life out of your body at that point. There's only so much energy to go around and you're just useless for the rest of your day. So I, I would want to do less repetitions or I, I'd be more about giving a higher intensity effort in a briefer time period and tap those deep fibers and walk away from it. You know, I've seen training, you know, John Little does that, that, that maximum contraction training, right? And, and he has that down to where it's one to six seconds, you know? And yeah, I could see, you know, at that point I could see, and I did apply some static holds in that manner. I, I forgot to mention static holds as well. In that manner where I would lift an extra heavy weight and hold it for a short brief time period. But the mission that I was trying to accomplish was to stimulate the very deepest fibers maximum contraction and and let them know i need you to remain here and i'm gonna drop a little bombshell on you in a minute so um go ahead i know you want to say something no, wait uh, on me you could you could tell by my face um no i just wanted to say before you go to diet do you want to just talk us through the lower body routine first i don't think you mm -hmm. covered that yet and then then go on start and and, and also the other factors that that come into play during that that pre-contest prep Yes. Uh, let me wrap up that whole month by month action by letting you know that I would train that way much more intensely using higher intensity techniques. And I did that straight up until about seven, six weeks out. At that point, I was ready to step on stage and I literally was, you know, existing for six weeks. I was existing. I was faking it. I'd, I'd, I'd fake it. I'd go to work and, and my clients had no idea what I was doing, but I'd fake it high energy and all that. I'd have to turn the show must go on. You know what I mean? 
So yep. I would turn it up at, at home. I'd, I'd sit out in my truck before I'd walk into my house. I have a young family and a, a beautiful young wife as well. And boy, you know, when I would pull that truck up and I see those kids running out the door, I go, all right, I got about one minute here, <laughs> you know, to get it together and, and have an attitude adjustment, you know, and I'd have to turn it up for their sakes because otherwise life sucks. You know, when you're a bodybuilder, you know, you have to be able to step away from what you're doing and not meditate on it the whole way through day and night. And I generally would not talk about it. I never let anybody in the gym know what I was doing when a contest was. I didn't want anybody asking me about it. So that's why the the benefit of being fairly lean to start with was that a lot of people had no idea when a contest, when I'd be training for a contest. So that helped a lot. Okay. So just to give a little idea, right? Uh, the leg workout, the leg workout was, uh, I, 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 when I say pre-exhaust, Again, an isolation exercise followed by a compound exercise. Uh, I'm not a leg extension guy anymore. I've, uh, I've, I've tapped that. Uh, I went back <laughs> to the well one too many times as a younger man. Uh, I can stack just about any leg extension machine I ever tried. And, you know, my kneecaps absolutely revile leg extensions. They do not feel good. Oh. I don't do them. Yeah, I don't do them even for higher repetitions, lighter weights. They just never feel good to me. So I actually uh, took a book out of Tom Platz's page and uh, took a, pa- a page out of his book. And yes, and I would... After warming up on my squats, I'm a squatter, so I would either do barbell back squats or barbell front squats. Those are my two favorite movements for my thighs. And, uh, you know, I'll refer you to my pictures, okay? There's, there's evidence right there. They work for me and my structure. Everybody's not the same, but for me, you know, they created great looking thighs for me. And I, I, I enjoy those two movements. Squats or front squats would be my compound movement. I would start with, as I said, a page out of Tom Platz's book, I would start with sissy squats on the hack squat machine. And I'm talking, wow, you know, that's an isolation exercise right there that man, uh, whoo, <laughs> taking a set of those to 15 or 20 repetitions to positive failure, man. And I say 15 to 20 because Doing them heavier than that is, I think, a little bit dangerous when you're talking about doing real sissy squats where your hip moves away from the hack squat and you're really going deep into it. So I would do those for 15 to 20 repetitions and immediately hobble on over to the squat rack that was preloaded with a barbell and either do back or front squats. And boy, oh boy, man, I give it everything I got on that thing for six to 10 repetitions. That's all it would take. Of course, my partner would be right there with me the whole way through. And once that would be done, that would be the end of that. That would be one of my leg workouts on my quads. The other quad workout, which I'll share with you, is my favorite that I did during that entire time period. And I still do it to this day. And I love it so much is I would do front squats with a certain weight. And I would take that to positive failure. And I mean, really, to where I'm about to dump that barbell. And I'd rack it really quick. My partner would throw on an additional 50 to 100 pounds, and I'd step back with that barbell on my back and go right into back squats. And man, oh man, I don't know, man. You know, the, the, the feeling that that would give, because front squats do use a little bit more quad than the back squat. The back squat uses more glute, hamstring, adductors, uh, your back for that matter. And when those quads are a little bit pre-exhausted from that front squat and you jump into it with a, a regular back squat, man, with, with literally zero rest, it hits so hard and so intensely that it did create that same effect for me. So those are my two quad workouts that I would use. And then I would either do one or another of these two exercises that I would either do hip thrusters of the barbell across my hip. And that's mainly people will recognize that as a glute exercise. However, the primary function of your hamstring is hip extension. So as in shoving your knee towards the back end of your body, and that is a hip uh, or a hip thruster. Yes. So I got a lot out of that in my hamstrings and my glutes, both the entire chain of the back end of my lower body. So I would do either hip thrusters or an isolation hamstring exercise like a seated leg curl or a lying leg curl and i would wrap it all up with 
either. My favorite is donkey calf raises, and I'm going to have some good videos coming out soon of my partner, myself, knocking out some good donkey calf raises. So you guys can all see how I set that up. You'll find that on my website, MrAmericaHeart.com. That's a little plug. I know I did that. No, that's fine. <laughs> Feel free. Okay. And then, uh, and then, so it would be either one of those two exercises, and I would do those for 12 to 20 repetitions with as massive a weight as I can handle on my calves. And again, to positive failure. And again, I would do all of those high intensity techniques. I'd use them the closer we got to, you know, seven weeks out from the show, month by month. And, and I'm a pretty compartmentalized type of individual. So when I do use a technique like static holds, for example, I'll try and do for a solid month, all the exercises that involve that I can do great static holds on. So that's how I generally choose a lot of the exercises that I would do during a certain time period as the contest would get closer. And then once I would be done with that technique, like I'd eventually be done with pre-exhaust. So I'd be, eh, don't want to do it anymore. And then, okay, I do static holds and I kind of work up the high intensity ladder and eventually get to those negatives and maybe force negatives, which are brutal. So as I would use each one of those, they would go by the wayside after, you know, three or four weeks. And then I would literally take off, you know, six or seven entire days during contest prep, but I would need it because of the kind of damage I was causing to the muscle and the rest was necessary. And I jump right back into it. So really I was kind of breaking all the rules, uh, during contest prep. I mean, again, sacrilege for a bodybuilder, much less a natural bodybuilder to take an entire six or seven days off when they're only four months out or two months out from a show. But I would do it, you know, fearlessly because I, I knew better. I knew that the muscle wasn't going to go anywhere at that point. I did the kind of high intensity, deep down work that was necessary. And then with that lower body workout, uh, am I being too wordy, Lawrence? No, Are you with this me? Great. I'm, I'm following you. <laughs> okay. With that lower body workout, I would also throw in ab work. And when I say ab work, I'm a, a big planker. I just do planks. I either do uh, a straight front plank or side planks. Uh, and I would do it for time anywhere. And I did those for anywhere from three to six minutes. So it would be kind of brutal and then jump to the side and do a minute on each side. And that would be the end of the abdominal workout, maybe three, four minutes of that. And those workouts, uh, again, the primary, primary function of your abdominals is stabilization. So I, I, I was never a big abdominal guy doing, you know, sit-ups, leg raises, you know, wood choppers with cables and all that stuff. It's just not my thing, you know, when the primary function is stabilization. So I would do planks as the main abdominal work. And then once that was done, that leg workout, uh, I'd shift back to the upper body workout the following week. And again, that would either be shoulders and arms or chest and back. And the chest and back workout, I know I didn't go in detail about that, but the chest and back workout would be pre-exhaust really quickly. Yeah, pre-exhaust. I would yeah. do, I would do for sure dumbbell flies. I, I generally hate all kinds of cables. Uh, they don't feel good on my shoulders. I would either do dumbbell flies or a static hold on a pec deck. And then I would jump directly into a compound movement. My favorite is incline bench press, uh, with dumbbells or with a barbell. And then again, the isolation exercise would be for six to 10 repetitions. The compound movement would be for you know, three to five repetitions. And again, to positive failure, much later on, I would switch over to those high intensity techniques. The back workout, I feel everything in my lats. I, I'm one of those guys, you know, so I, I don't get too fancy with that one. I can do and I would do uh, front chins. I would do undergrip chins. I would do uh, bar barbell rows, real bent over barbell rows. So I know people don't. They'll say that's not pre-exhaust. And honestly, yeah, out of all the exercises, all the body parts, that's one I never had to worry much about. So uh, I really you've got some turned... pretty impressive lats. <laughs> thank thank you. I appreciate it. The the Mister America training for that. I just would do those compound movements right there. I very rarely did a isolation exercise. There was no need when I, when I feel all lats, my lats would be sore after every back workout like that. And then I would deadlift every other back workout. I would do regular fashion barbell deadlifts off the floor for six to 10 repetitions. And, and in general, I'm a six to 10 rep guy on those back exercises. And again, to positive failure and maybe throw in some higher intensity techniques later on, but that was pretty much it. So every third upper body workout, I did my chest and back. I would do two shoulder and arm workouts, A1, A1, and then A2 
on that A workout each week. And then I go back to A1, A1, A2. And then I would do the same, you know, B leg workout each week following the upper workout. I would do a lower body workout later that week. Uh, diet wise, preparing for just before, just before you go to diet. Um, yes. What, just a couple questions that came out of you saying that. So what would your, where your, so there were some, obviously some instances where you would almost superset. So you'd pre exhaust something or move quickly from one exercise to another, but when you weren't doing that, what were the rest intervals like between exercises? Was it just enough time to set the next exercise up? So no deliberate rest, or would you have a set period of time between exercises? Man, excellent question. And I, I wish I had video. I, I might do this sometime. I may video an entire workout. Oh, yeah. So, do it. Do so it. You, you, yeah. So you all can see how Marvin, Marvin is my training partner. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, I have a training partner. His name is Marvin. And, you know, I, all the positives of Marvin is that, you know, he's Mr. Consistency. He's very intense and he does everything that I want to do in the gym. If I had to say the only negative <laughs> where Marvin is concerned is, uh, at any given point in time, uh, he's not quite as driven as me individually. And that would piss me off when I would see him back off a little bit, you know? So he would back off quite often. I'd catch him backing off. And so the reason I'm mentioning that is that early on in the prep for that contest in particular, uh, it would piss me off so much to see that, that my mission at that point would be to move even faster after he would, I would go first, I would do my pre-exhaust, my superset, or maybe not. And as we would get closer to the show and I would use, uh, those higher intensity techniques, I would do my work and then he would do his, but the moment he got done with his, I would quickly strip off that barbell, move on to the next exercise or, you know, Get, gather up our stuff and move on to the next one as fast as I could. And it wasn't a matter of doing, you know, the rush factor, high intensity workout. I, I, it really wasn't that. Uh, I don't think that's absolutely necessary, to be honest with you. Uh, cardiovascularly, I think it's great. I think that, you know, the Arthur Jones studies years ago on those uh, uh, at West Point, I think they were fantastic. I think that the conditioning effect, the metabolic effect, Pat, Pat from, you know, NorCal Strength, he's very much interested in all of that. And, and I absolutely agree. You're going to get a metabolic effect, an increase, not just in your, uh, uh, ability to lift weights, but, and to generate lean muscle mass increases, but also a cardiovascular, uh, benefit. However, having said that, my focus at that one point in time would not be cardiovascular benefits. It would be still stimulating the muscle. That was really my whole focus would be stimulate the muscle. Tell that, give it that signal that it cannot go anywhere. There's no option. I need you to stay here no matter what and increase even because, you know, this is the most stressful thing happened to this body and this organism. And I need it to have as much muscle mass as possible. So, I would move kind of quick to answer your question more directly, Lawrence. It would be I go and then Marvin would go. So basically I'm already eating up about a minute rest right there, a minute and a half, you know, uh, say a minute for him to do his set or his super set, a minute to a minute and a half. And then we'd quickly move on to something else because it was single set to failure. So we would move on to something else and hopefully it would already be set up. If it's in my garage training, then, you know, it would already be set up. If it's not, and we're in the public gym, then of course we'd have to take an extra minute to set it up, but we were moving fast. I mean, very fast. So, uh, all workouts would be completed entirely from the moment we show up at the gym. I, I was able to get all those workouts done in under 30 minutes. I mean, that's with you know, extensive warm ups at 4 a.m. That's when we would train is at 4 a.m. So how do you train that early? I mean, personally, <laughs> if I train that early, if I, if I get up early to train, I just, I don't really, maybe it's because I don't tend to warm up and maybe that's the problem. Um, but I just don't have it in my grip. I'm more of a late morning or afternoon type of guy. So. Well, yeah, uh, it, it's what you said. You know, I, it, it first is probably the habit I've, I've had to adjust to that mainly because of work scheduling and training clients from like 6 a.m. on, right? Mm -hmm. So 
waking up early has been a habit now for well over 15 years. So getting my stuff in before getting to the clients or getting to my work has helped me out mentally so much, but then physically I'm definitely at a peak, uh, in that first, you know, two hours of being awake. And for me personally, later on in the day, I've tried it in the middle of the day. I usually have a break in the middle of the day between my morning and my evening clients. And I tried to do that. It just didn't work for my bio rhythms or for my physiology. It just didn't feel right. I never felt right. And uh, I'd have too much on my mind. It was, you know, it's more mental than physical, to be honest with you. That's all. It's more mental. My, my brain at that point early in the morning is only focused compartmentally on one thing. That's it. You know, that's just my personality is just train. And we don't even talk about personal crap or what's crappy things going on in our lives. You know, Marvin doesn't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. You know, I mean, we both know when something's up, we could tell. But back then, especially, uh, you know, with a goal at hand, you know, truthfully, the great thing about my, my boy Marvin is that he would just kind of whisper in my ear as I'm, I'm doing a set or warming up. He'd say, man, you know, and he'd name a few names because he knew some of the guys I'd be going up against. And he'd say, you know, uh, OK, you know, oh, the best was here's the best way. Right. But as I would do a set to failure, he, he, he would say to me as I would get down, he, he counts, say I was doing a set of eight or ten. He would count up to five and down from five. And he'd go, you know, four, five. Then he'd go fifth place fourth place, <laughs> third place like that. And now if you it. don't think, yeah, I would be like a rabid beast at the end of that set. Cause I was taking it seriously. You know, that was w the way I saw it, you know? So it was my one attempt to get first place in my mind. You have to find those little things, you know, to keep that motivation at an all time high. And again, that's my personality, you know? You, what did the warm up look like? You mentioned before how you might take when you were talking to um, Pat. You mentioned you might take sort of fifteen twenty minutes to warm up. What did that look yeah. like? Oh yes, what if I if I was like? doing yeah. yeah, if I was doing the the pre exhaust workouts, I would we would most definitely uh, warm up on both. I know that you know standard. My, my guy, Mike Menser, years ago used to recommend using, doing just the compound movement as a warm up. And as I've gotten a little bit older, you know, those, that does not work for me anymore, any longer. I have to go ahead and I have to get, do a warm up on both the isolation and the compound movement. And I would do as much as it took, Lawrence, as much as it took. So if it's like it is right now in Southern California this morning, it was 55 degrees, 54 degrees. Uh, you know, and, and within the next two or three weeks, it'll be down in the mid forties early in the morning. At times it'll drop down to, you know, freezing. We've had freezing out here at 32, 35 degrees early in the morning. So, and then it warms up. But if it's one of those mornings, you know, say between 32 and 50 degrees, uh, you know, which is cold for here, I know it doesn't compare to where you're at, <laughs> but over here, that's cold. So I have to go ahead and generally do as many warm-ups of that as possible. I would treat it as a, a sort of a psychological mounting or, you know, gathering up of arms, so to speak, where I would do, you know, very, very light, the isolation exercise followed by the compound, very, very light, and then, you know, increase the weight and he would increase the weight and we would go up and up and up, but nothing. Anyway, when I say increase the weight, I would take a power lifter approach. I, I, I'm very good friends with, uh, you know, Marissa Inda is a, a natural world powerlifting champion. And to see her warm up, it's a great example, you know, for her to get up, she weighs 112, 113 pounds. And for her to get up to, you know, a 300 pound squat, 315 pound squat, which she does, uh, to see her jump up and wait quickly and warm up. She does sets of three or sets of five to warm up. These are nowhere near failure. These are not real sets. The ignition switch is not on. It's only to warm up the joints. I might as well do jumping jacks for that matter, but I rather do the specific exercise, right? To get my joints and muscle fibers warmed up properly. And uh, so they're nowhere near failure. So if anybody calls that multiple set training, well, God bless them. That's fine. I'm not going to get ticky tack with them. Let them get to be 53 or 48 years old and start training in high intensity fashion. You're going to see you're going to need to do more warm ups than you ever did at 23. It doesn't work like that anymore. You need to do more warm ups, regardless of the temperature, regardless of any of that. So I would take whatever my my protocol was that day. If it was pre exhaust, I would warm up on both of the first 
two exercises of the day. And generally I'm good after that. If it's, I'm not doing pre-exhaust that day, then I would take the first compound movement of the day, maybe the first two and warm up on both gradually increasing the weight, but literally doing anywhere from, you know, three to five repetitions on each one of those warmups. So it would not be, you know, the old school golden era bodybuilding, right? You know, 20 repetitions and then a set of 15 and then a set of 10, a set of eight, a set of six, and now I'm ready to go. No, I, I wouldn't do that. And I wouldn't do that at all. That's way too much. And is it's exhausting. So it's, it's low intensity work. I'm not interested in that. You know, how did you, um, manage progression so would you you you've obviously spo- already spoken about the repetition range that you aimed for and um, which changes obviously throughout the um timeline closer to the contest so yes. how how did you manage progression would you okay you you hit a maximum number of reps within a range then you increase the weight by a certain percentage is that how you did it like can you talk us just through some of that yes uh i would you know depending on Depending on the body parts, depending on the, I, I know for me in particular, and, and, you know, there are ways you can test yourself out. You can, guys can check it out and search it online that, you know, if, if you're familiar with your, your body or your muscle fiber types, fast twitch, slow twitch, you're going to find on your body that there's some exercises, there's some body parts that, uh, respond better to higher repetitions. Okay. When I do, for example, I'm gonna give you two quick examples. Okay. Uh, and way back, Charles Poliquin actually pointed it out that there are two in particular. One is the soleus muscle in your calf. So doing seated calf raises in general, uh, there's a very low percentage of, of fast twitch fibers. You have about 87% uh, slow twitch fibers in your soleus muscle. Generally speaking, speaking on the bell curve of humans. Okay. On the lateral head of your deltoid, again, it's about 87% slow twitch fibers. So because of that, I would, uh, the repetition range on those body parts, I would use slightly higher repetitions, uh, and, and go ahead and knock those out with higher repetitions. Okay. The, uh, Boy, wait a second. Did I just jump off the subject? Wait a second. Hit me back again with a question. You said, yeah, did I just, boy, I just went off on a tangent no, no, right there. No, I lost it's, myself in that. It's interesting. We were talking about, um, how you manage progression. So, you know, got it. Yeah. You back? Got it. <laughs> yeah. I'm back. So, so basically setting my progression in my, uh, based upon my range of repetitions, that's how I would do it first. I would know when to increase the weight. Uh, generally speaking, generally, I'm saying, uh, by the repetition range. And of course, the ones I just mentioned, if it's seated calf raises, if it's lateral deltoid raises, I know for a fact on my body, I respond better to slightly higher repetitions in that 12 to 20 repetition range. And when I do those types of exercises, once I can get 20 repetitions, that's time to increase the weight. I would increase the weight, uh, but only by something like, yeah. You know, I'd have to calculate it out to be somewhere in the, you know, five to 10% range. So it's not a big, big jump, five to 10%, somewhere in that zone. And I do use micro loading. I do use, uh, I have plate mates. I have, those are the magnetic ones that you can hook up to dumbbells. Uh, I also use fractional plates for the barbells, anywhere from a quarter pound plates up to three quarter of a pound plates or one pound plates I have in both my garage. And I also keep a set in the gym of both of those. So, uh, increases do come. You see what I'm saying? And I, and an interesting fact also is that your brain really can't pick up uh, on if you've increased the weight by less than 2%. So if you ever have the, the, you know, fancy to go ahead and calculate out what 2% on any exercise you're doing is, if you're, you know, bench pressing a hundred pounds, if you would increase the weight by anything less than 2%, your brain cannot pick it up. Your muscles know the difference, but your brain, it'll feel exactly the same to you if you just put on 1.5 pounds on the bar instead of two full pounds. Your brain cannot pick it up. So it's a fun way to use the Kaizen principle, K-A-I-Z-E-N, which is, you know, just adding little by little by little. So, uh, but 
I just threw that in on the side, by the way. Okay, <laughs> just to let you know that I use a small Japanese fractional Japanese philosophy plays. in there, is it? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but it helps, you know. I mean, even if you haven't hit your repetition range, the high end of it, you can throw that Kazen principle into action at any point in time, and it does work. Okay, and you won't feel the difference. So, quite often in pre-contest mode, like I just mentioned. Training for the Mr. America, I would in fact use the Kazen principle more often than the one I'm describing to you, which is the hitting the top range of my repetition goals. Okay. So when I have hit the top range, I'm going to go ahead, like I said, on those two body parts on the seated calf raise on the lateral head of my deltoid. I'll always do 12 to 20 repetitions and I'll only go up five to 10% in the weight. When I increase the weight, small increase. If I'm on any of the other body parts in general, I operate between six to 10 repetitions for most of the year. And then I'll go eight to 12, uh, you know, as I get closer to the show. When I do those exercises, I will increase it by a larger percentage because it knocks me right back down to six. Okay. So, uh, I operate very well on low repetitions. Uh, it's worked well for me. I have really good form on most of my exercises. So I have no fear of damaging anything. And, and literally, Lawrence, to be honest with you, I walk around here today. I have no injuries. My rotator cuffs are super strong. My knees are great. My lower back is great, but I do take care of those things. And, you know, if there is any sort of an issue whatsoever that does pop up, I'm quick to get it worked on. I have a great team of people out there that I rely on and, you know, have bartered with even and worked great deals with. So uh, whether it's getting a chiropractic adjustment, soft tissue work of, of the best kind, uh, you know, all of that. And uh, I'll, I'll definitely seek all of that out. But let me give you the bombshell that you haven't asked about. I mentioned a little bit earlier. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to show some of my video on this soon. Uh, I did use an electric muscle stimulator. I don't know if you even thought to ask that, no. Lawrence. I don't want to give you a gotcha question right there on you. I don't want to give you the gotcha, but a little bombshell. Fun thing to do, by the way. I, I did learn that, in fact, from Mike Menser years ago, and I've never mentioned it in any interview up until now, actually. Um, um, can you elaborate? Yeah, I have an EMS, an electric muscle stimulating machine, and uh, it my the brand that I like is Compex, it's C-O-M-P-E-X, and I've used that, oh, for years. And how I would use it is I would hook it onto the muscles, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of the listeners will know what I mean by the muscle stimulator. You can look it up on YouTube or on Amazon, Compex Muscle Stimulator, Electric muscle stimulator, and you'll see some great videos of, you know, people using them in the wrong way. Let me say that. First of all, there's a lot of YouTube videos of guys and girls hooking that onto their bodies in the wrong way. Okay. Putting electrodes on the, on either end of your muscle and, you know, having it fire away is to be taken seriously. And, you know, it's elect, it's electricity that you're pushing through, you know, a muscle and certainly under no circumstances whatsoever. Man, I, I've seen a couple of videos of them putting those electrodes across their chest, across their pec. And I don't care who you are. That's just plain stupid. Okay. <laughs> You're looking for, you know, cardiac arrest right there. I mean, it's just dumb. So what, so, what would be the protocol? Um, when would you use that type of thing? What would be the upside yes. as well? The, the protocol is, oh, I'm about to get there. The protocol would Sorry. be on a, <laughs> on a day. Yeah. As I would get closer and closer to the contest, as I got closer and closer, uh, you know, when I mentioned those high intensity techniques, it would get to the point where, you know, literally my entire, I'll just pick a random body part for you. My entire tricep workout at some point would end up being, uh, dumbbell, overhead tricep, you know, extensions, French press, right? With, with a, a single dumbbell, a heavy dumbbell. And, uh, at the ultimate end of my training cycle, the most intense thing I would do would be forced negative repetitions. And what that would be is, is I would take a very heavy weight and I would have Marvin, uh, pulling down on the dumbbell and I would fight him the whole way through. And it would take us six to eight seconds to pull that weight down. And it would be with a maximum effort on my end. And we would only do two repetitions, one, two repetitions like that. And that was the entire tricep workout. So knowing how deep that got, 
I, I, I also was not expending tons and tons of energy in those workouts. That means I was putting in a grand total of about 10 or 12 seconds into my triceps of direct tricep work. Okay. And that would be early in the morning at 4 a.m. As I said, later on that day, I would get home and, you know, after having lunch, I'd hook my electric muscle stimu stimulator up to my triceps and I would do a, a, work out on it. I would sit there and pump that thing up and uh, I would let it do a 15 or 20 minute workout on my tricep. And, you know, there's different modes you can put it in. So I would use it in a hypertrophy or a strength mode and it would make every single fiber possible in that tricep fire as hard as you can try consciously to make muscle fibers fire it doesn't even come close to what an electric muscle stimulator can do. So I was using it as insurance and I would use it not every single workout, but rather every few workouts, every two or three workouts, because I was using such high intensity techniques. I would in fact plug my triceps in and sit down at the table and my, my kids would have a great time, you know, watching this happen, you know, watching my muscles bounce around the place, but to actually physically see your own muscle contracting so hard and, and, and jumping off the bone to such a degree, you start, you realize the first time you've ever used one of these things that you can't make a muscle contract hard as hard as this thing can. So for me, I was sold the first time all done again in the name of trying to stimulate and let my body know that I needed every one of those fibers to remain or to even increase in size or to split with hyperplasia, right? I needed something to happen to those muscle fibers other than to be sacrificed for energy for existence purposes while I was in a pre-contest mode. I know there's some scientifically minded individuals out there that are just going to jump all over my ass about that one and say, Mah! there's nothing proven this or nothing proven that. I'm just telling you what I did and I'm sharing it for the benefit of, you know, Lawrence, your show, your listeners, uh, you know, just with all due respect, I respect you and what you're doing. And I, I wanted to give you a little bit something extra this time that I hadn't mentioned before. How's that sound? I, I appreciate I, it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, no, I, I, I kind of. I, I felt for you, you know, because I did do some lengthy interviews recently, right? With NorCal Strength and man, we covered so much. So this was, uh, it was good getting on with you right now and, and covering a lot specifically to, you know, contest prep and what would I do and how I did it specifically. And, and even to this day, I love my muscle stimulator. I love using my electric muscle stimulator and I'm, I, I already have video in the can that I'm going to put up, uh, on my YouTube. It's coming guys, go to my YouTube channel. Guys and girls, Mr. America Heart, you can find it on YouTube or go to my website, Mr. America Heart dot com and just hit any one of those social media links. You'll find the YouTube link is on there as well. And you'll see some of the videos I've already put up. But that one is coming. It's coming soon. Uh, I know I know uh, we're running over a little bit, but you have more time because I do want to discuss diet as well. Oh yes, yeah. I do. Let's go. Um, we'll, we'll, when we wrap up at the end, we'll also capture those details again and, and, uh, uh, where people can go to find out more. But before we go there, um, yes. I have to ask you this because I'm just really curious myself. Um, I'm very skeptical of, um, the concept of progressive overload. Um, it doesn't, you know, I, I recently interviewed, obviously I've interviewed a number of scientists. Um, yes. and it doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence to support that progressive overload is essential for optimizing hypertrophy. Um, mm. and that one, and I, it's my belief that one can train to, uh, mus momentary muscular failure regardless of the load. Uh, obviously mm -hmm. it makes more sense to use a load where you're going to fail within a shorter time window, but you're going to pretty much get the same benefits as you would if you actually increase the difficulty. Um, 
you know, just for myself, you know, I, I don't currently train with free weights or machines. I'm mostly using body weight. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm doing, you know, I'm doing chin ups and I, if I'm doing a chin up and I want to make it more difficult, I might do a hard partial range of motion and I might do a longer static at the top. Um, yeah. so I will do those protocols to like make it more difficult, but I'm not convinced that it makes a damn bit of difference. Mm. Um, how do you think about that? Do you think it's essential to use a heavy weight? Do you think most of that's psychological? What do you think? Well, I just got done telling you uh, that I use an electric muscle stimulator to stimulate <laughs> the deepest fibers in my muscles. So I'm going to flat out tell you that uh, I, I agree with you as well. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't want to be contradicting or be a walking contradiction. But you can so, be. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with being a contradiction. I mean, because you're saying, well, I agree with you, but just for insurance, I do it anyway and I enjoy it. Is there that, you go. Is that where you were going? I, Sorry, I put words I, in your mouth, but I, yeah, I was going to say the way you worded it, you said keeping the time period short, hitting momentary muscular failure, which means you are tapping those fast twitch fibers. Okay. It's, it's not, you know, a five minute long set a four minute long set that you're doing, right? Is that what you mean? You're doing Correct. less. It's yeah. We're, to, we're talking like 60, 90 second window, something like that. Perfect. So, so what's that yes. like? I don't know, yeah. eight, uh, six to 10 reps, maybe something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. On a standard repetition, you know, cadence and protocol. Yes, I would agree. And you did say you're making it harder. Okay. When you want to make it harder, uh, the number one, the number one requirement uh, for, for creating that change in your physiology. And that change can be defined, of course, as getting stronger, as perhaps creating hypertrophy, which I think is one of the greatest mysteries in our world right now. I don't think that's even been perfected as far as creating hypertrophy even, okay? I'm talking about, you know, sans anabolic steroids and hormone, you know, uh, uh, supplementation of any kind, right? Without, insulin growth hormone or steroids or anabolics of any kind we're talking about the natural system hypertrophy being created in the natural system that being the case i i have to agree with how you worded that and that is you know you doing even body weight exercises as you're doing you you're creating a harder so within the realm of standard overload right Standard as we understand it, increasing the weight on the barbell, right? <laughs> Doing more repetitions. And as far as that goes, yeah, I, I don't think it's necessary. I, I really don't. I, I think that what you're doing, the elements of what you're doing are, are truly the same. Okay. It's the same. Your, your physiology, your body will not change unless you, you give it a damn good reason to change. So you are doing something. I mean, I've seen your physique. I've seen, I, you know, I've a, you have a good physique. So you're doing something right, obviously. So, and it's not just having, you know, six pack abs. You have good shoulders. You have good biceps. You have good arms. You know, I mean, obviously you're doing something right. I would, I would go as far as to say there probably is a point that you're going to hit where you're going to find on certain things because I've had clients over the years that were not, let's say, in this country even that, you know, worked out of their garage that didn't have equipment, that type of thing. And I had to get really creative with them on what to do. Right. And you can only do so many single leg squats you know, <laughs> I mean, at some point in time with body weight, right, you can do a pistol, okay, but it's not quite hitting your legs the same way. You know, it, there is a point where I think you may have to default on, on having a mix, right, of what you currently do and then down the line going, well, you know, I, I, maybe I should do a squat of some form, you know, and, and getting a little bit progressive about it. And then the other factor involved is, is that we haven't even touched on is, uh, because we're talking about all pre contests, right? Is for longevity purposes, and I don't mean longevity of your, your lifespan, but longevity of your interest in what you're doing. You absolutely cannot do the same thing. You know, for 10 years, 20 years, you're just not. You, I can come back to you, Lawrence, in, in three years or four years, and I believe that we're going to be talking about how you used to do that and how I used to do that 
you know, and how, hey, wasn't it fun when we did that interview and how we were talking about how we used to do those things and how we've kind of morphed into something else even, you know, and that may come from just general interest and, and avoiding boredom or being highly motivated to try something new, or maybe it is, you know, moving away in a lifetime. I don't know what the sixties will hold for me. You know, maybe, you know, I, right now I enjoy having muscle. I enjoy, you know, looking different. I enjoy from my, it's still a rush for me to, you know, I can take the shirt off. I look like a bodybuilder, you know, it's, it, I still have the physique, you know, I'm within a few pounds of, of, of my best form. You know, I, I enjoy it that much. And for you enjoying what you're doing right now, that is a motivating factor. I would never try to convince you otherwise. I would be, if anything, you know, saying to you, Hey brother, I want to see how far you can go with this, to be honest with you. You know, I really do. I want to know, and I want the results of what you're doing so that we're not just speaking in theory. I want to see what actually what you do. And down the line, you'll have more information that you could probably share with all of us, you know, on what you're doing. And I think it would be absolutely stupid and asinine to argue uh, with you and well, say you're doing word. something wrong. Which one? Asinine or well, stupid? Uh, uh, well, the former. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, no, I, I appreciate it. And it's, uh, it's, it, this is very helpful for me, obviously. Um, you know, you're far more experienced than I am. And I can't believe you're 53. You, you look unbelievable. Oh. Like even in your face. Like, thank you. It is truly is resistance training truly is the fountain of youth. Eh? <laughs> wow. Yeah, and you've heard. So I know you see. I know you've listened, I've seen the, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I've I've listened, and but also, um, there was that great research that came out that showed the reversal of expression on a number of. I think it's like 196 genes that reversed to a youthful expression as a result of strength training, which was yep. phenomenal. Obviously, Doug has spoken about that at, at great length. Um, yep. I want to talk to you about diet. Um, so your your kind of contest diet. Could you? I guess again, start out maybe twelve months out. What the diet looked like then, how you de- how you decide on calories and macros and things like that, and then how that evolved closer to meat day. Okay, uh, calories in the first place. Uh, how I would determine calories in my off season, my deepest off season, say a year out from from that event, uh, I would. Uh, I always had an idea of where I was at. I, I'm in a very good habit in my kitchen. I have a kitchen scale. My kids, my, my wife, everybody has, you know, seen me using it. My wife uses it regularly as well. So we have an idea of the portions that we're all using. You know, we actually, the kids, not so much, but you know, my wife, myself. And so at 12 months out, I would, you know, know. Uh, roughly, and I mean within just a couple hundred calories of where I was and how many calories I would be eating, I would max it out and again, staying fairly lean. And in, in prep for, you know, the Mr. America, I was you know, up at, you know, phew, boy, I was up at uh, 3000 calories a day, 3200 per day. And at that amount in an off season without doing any cardio work of any nature, that's a whole other story right there. I'm not going to send you off on that direction about the cardio. Okay. We'll talk about that one another time, please. Okay. (laughs) What did you, what did you weigh when you were doing 3,200? Boy, this is a really good question because, you know, I'm again, not a scale guy, but my weight would fluctuate uh, between the deepest off season. I would be, uh, I, I do have an idea and I would be at two, Oh, three, two, oh, four. And then on stage, I was 192, 193. How tall are you? I'm just under 5'11. Oh, well, I didn't realize. That's pretty big. I didn't realize I was that short, actually. You know, I thought I was more like, <laughs> to be honest with you, I thought I was more like just under six feet. And then, you know, I, I, I had to get a new life insurance policy a few years ago. <laughs> And it was right, right around that Mr. America. And when they measured me and they, I said, uh, check that again. And then they did it again. And I said, man, it must be that the hair is missing off the top of my head right now or something. But yeah, I'm just under 5'11. And to be natural and to be, you know, the week of a contest to be weighing, you know, 192. I, I'm not the biggest genetic freak in natural bodybuilding. Uh, there's, there's, uh, one gentleman. I, I love him. He's a great, great guy. And, and I, I consider him to be the best of all time in natural bodybuilding. And it's Richard Gazdecki. And he's uh, out of the UK. He's in England. And uh, again, fantastic individual. Uh, I've met him more than once. We've competed against each other. And his wife, beautiful woman, 
and uh, and he's just a very intelligent guy and he rocks that stage at six feet one 216 218 ripped to the bone so that's fully you know 20 pounds heavier than than i would be or more and he's just a couple inches taller than me so i i consider him to be that type of genetic mesomorphic you know ultra freak and in my case i'm more of a let's say mesomorph uh and endo endomorph the the leaner one right ectomorph yeah oh i apologize ectomorph so uh, a meso ectos with you know tendencies towards the ecto it's a spectrum Uh, isn't it and you're falling somewhere on that yeah yeah yeah. i got it yes so so yeah i would be that's the range that i would be and i would start out at about 203 204 and i only would have about 10 pounds to drop and at 30 30 200 calories per day it, it would be a nice healthy balance you know of uh, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. And the, my, my favorite of all time, I would be eating, uh, carbohydrates. I have, you know, we can go into another time, all the details of diet. I mean, I'm, I have no problem sharing it. Uh, I have, you have to like what you eat. First of all, that's number one. Okay. On any eating plan diet, if you're going to maintain it and stick to it, you can't be eating, you know, uh, you know, fish and water tuna and water and <laughs> you know and just meat it it's it just it, if you're going to do that unless you love those things unless you love them you know there's there's going to be a rebound at some point in time and i in particular you know i had a little bit of everything and the majority would be carbohydrates uh, in my case i'm talking about the mr america now i'm going to give you the update as we go okay but for the mr america at 48 when i was 48 I was eating uh, calorically 3,200 to start. I would use a a c- cyclic, a cyclical rotation of calories as my uh, show would get closer. So uh, there were certain days of the week, and I'm going to save this. I have to save this for my book, so you're going to have to excuse me on this part, Lawrence, okay, because I'm writing about this. Okay, so uh, you know I would use a caloric rotation of two or three various types and in natural bodybuilding you know the uh, i don't know any who don't use a rotation of some sort so when i tell you i was as high as 3200 to start but that at my lowest my calories i would in fact get down to 1600 per day and that would be boy that would be something, you know, but, uh, you know, would I be hungry? Yes, I would. And, uh, you know, was I losing muscle mass? No, I wasn't because I was using a cyclical uh, approach each week at that point. And I would have higher calorie days. I would have a medium calorie day, but I would adjust, you know, all of the macronutrients up or down depending on the day. So uh, was I a low carb, di- uh, a low carb guy at any point in time? No. I've never been competitively. I know today the guys, they not only cycle their calories, they cycle their carbs. And I never was. I got in fantastic shape eating the carbs. So I always questioned it and said, why would I? Why would I drop them? You know, I enjoy them. They keep me on my plan and my muscle is still here. So why would I lower my carbs? I mean, by nature, just from going down as low as 1600 calories, my carbs would be lower. Right. And then at its tightest, my lowest would be 1600 calories and I would bounce it between 2200 and 1600. As I said, that would be the lowest that I would go. That would be my range between 16 and 2200. And I had a cycle in particular that I would use during my week, but it always landed between that range right there. So uh, would I have a cheat day worked in there as well? Yes, I would. And how many calories would that be? Uh, good luck counting because it would go until my stomach was sticking so far out. It's not even funny. Or once a week cheat day or how regular would that be? Uh, it would it would be every other week at that point. So it would be every 14th day around that area unless I was really tapped out. If I was really tapped out, I would do it sooner. Yeah, that would it, be, That's one of those things. Would that be – sorry. Would that be strategic to like spike metabolism and – reset as it leptin sensitivity or something like that um I just absolutely to, right okay. absolutely yeah. w- without getting too scientific and, about it yes i'm you can tell i'm you know there's a lot of guys involved in in high intensity training that are very very 
you know, scientific and, and get, you know, can quote certain studies and all of that. And, you know, I'm, while, while I do handle, I do teach heavy duty, by the way, I didn't mention that, you know, for Joanne Sharkey and Mike Menser.com, I do handle the email online consultations for her and they can go and check that out over there. And I'm teaching heavy duty specifically for her in the authentic way that Mike taught it because I'm so familiar with the system. I'm so familiar with his writings. I, I, it's other than my holy Bible. I'm a Christian. So other than my Bible, I know his writings that well. Okay. So, uh, you know, in that sense, uh, I, I know his works very, very well. Now, as far as all of the other studies that are being done on a regular basis, do I have an interest in some of them? Yes, I do. And I'll look at them and I'll, you know, study them. And like I said, I wish there were some done on some natural bodybuilders to an extent at this point, <laughs> some double blind studies using them, right? Uh, with some actual testing on their bodies, some advanced natural bodybuilders. I would really love to see that. Am I going to do that? No, I'm not going to do that. Sure. Uh, so does that leave leeway for making mistakes along the way? Yes, it does. On my end, yes, it does. And I have to do and say things like I have said to you that just for insurance purposes, I would do certain things, right? Like use my you know, high intensity techniques, progressive overload and my electric muscle stimulator. Maybe that's overkill in some people's worlds, but I would do that and, and drop that volume down so low, as low as I could, you know, to accommodate it all. Now, Having said all of that, I'm not, you know, the biggest uh, scientist. I respect people like Doug McGuff to the nth degree, and uh, and I really appreciate their work and listen to them quite often. And then, uh, you know, when you ask me a question just now, simply about why I would do that as far as bumping up those calories, yes, number one is my metabolism. I didn't want it to fall off. I always think in terms of, you know. Uh, our, our bodies are a survival machine. While I was after a cosmetic effect, it's still a survival machine. So what kind of input is my machine getting? And at one point in time, if it's on a severely low caloric diet plan, it's going to get the signal that I'm in a life or death situation out in the wilderness somewhere. My survival is at stake. There's no body fat left on this physique. I'm getting down to where it's going to have to sacrifice muscle for fuel. So what can it do? And right when it's about to do that, because I am keeping a close monitor on it by, you know, I have a great eye. I can look in the mirror and I wasn't deceiving myself. Obviously, I have a good eye, right? So I wasn't deceiving myself. And that bumping up of the calories and, you know, it would be loaded with crap. I mean, I would really throw some food in there that I would never eat, you know, <laughs> on a low calorie diet. I mean, really pancakes. Yes. Butter. Yes. I mean, chocolate. Yes. Pizza. Yes. Cheeseburgers. Yes. All of it. Yes. From morning until night for an entire day. I wouldn't do just a cheat meal. I would take a day. That's why it was, you know, more like every 14 days. And, you know, that's where it would hit for me personally. So that's how I did it. Oh, that's, that's really interesting and I appreciate you going into detail. Yeah, I mean, there's so much uncovered territory, so we're going to have to do a part two at some point. Um, yes. Yeah, there's so, there's so much I didn't cover, but I've got to, I've got to wrap up there. But, um, do you want to just tell, I know you said a few things already, but do you want to just tell the listeners like the best place to find out more about you at this time? Oh, yes. I, I do have my new website. I did launch it in the last month. It's MrAmericaHeart.com. So it's M-R-A-M-E-R-I-C-A. And my last name is Heart, H-E-A-R-T.com. And if they go there, you know, that's really where you're going to find not only a whole bunch of current blog material that I, I put up, and I put up a lot for the general public, okay? That's very, very important and close to my heart is that I, I am considering that the majority of the people out there uh, that, you know, that need help really uh, are in the general public and they're not, you know, well-versed in high-intensity training, for example. And, you know, I want to reach out to them as well. And, there are aspects of high intensity training, fundamental principles that do apply to the general public. And I do apply it to them myself every week, week in, week out on my clients. And so 
I'm offering up a lot of material, both to the high intensity community, but also to the general public. And that's done through my website that I just gave you, Mr. America Heart. Dot com, And you can find all of my social links up there as well, in particular that YouTube link, because that is where I'm putting up a massive amount of trainer tip video. OK, and that's with, you know, live training of, you know, either I'm just talking for a few minutes, really quick, quick hit, you know, between four and seven minute videos. That's what they all are. OK, four to seven minutes. I don't want your attention for more than that. I'm not going to take up valuable minutes of your life. Four to seven minutes. You're in, you're out. It's either me speaking quickly and plainly or it's me showing a training tip quickly on somebody right there, right in the gym, or even on myself, right there in the gym. And the gym happens to be mainly my garage. <laughs> so that's the way it happens. I'm very jealous. I, I want to set up my own space some point, uh, maybe get some machines, maybe get some free weights. So that's one yeah. of one of the, the medium term goals. Um, Look, thank you so much for coming on the show, John. It's been a it's been a joy to talk about this stuff with you. And as I said, I'd love to arrange a part two at some point. Um, for everyone listening, to find the show notes, links, and resources for this episode and all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.org. And until next time, guys, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Before you head off, head on over to corpwarrior.com, that's C-O-R-P warrior.com, to get your free high-intensity training Google progress chart and ebook of six interview transcripts of some of my top guests, including Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay, and Bill A. Simone on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss, and overall health in an efficient, effective, and sustainable way. These transcripts are deliberately not verbatim. Instead, they've been transcribed in an easy Easy read format to make it more enjoyable and easier for you to quickly pick out what you need and start getting results. To get your ebook, head on over to corpwarrior.com, enter your email address, then check your email for an email from me with a confirmation link. Once you click the link, you will be instantly redirected to a PDF version of the transcripts. This episode is brought to you by the Resistance Exercise Conference, the science and application of strength training for health and human performance. Would you like to learn from the top strength training researchers, network and connect with other exercise professionals from all over the world, join a welcome reception on a Friday night to build relationships with other strength training professionals, experience an early morning workout from an expert trainer to kickstart your Saturday, and get inspired, rejuvenated, and focus on your strength training business I certainly do, and that is why I am attending and interviewing all of the speakers at the event. The Resistance Exercise Conference will be held on the 9th and 10th of March 2018 in Minneapolis, Minnesota at the Commons Hotel. To get 10% off your entry fee, head on over to resistanceexerciseconference.com, click the registration button, and enter Corporate Warrior 10 in the promo code field in PayPal. I am very excited about this and I've wanted to attend for years. Sign up now at resistanceexerciseconference.com and get 10% off with promo code CORPORATEWARRIOR10 and I look forward to meeting you in person.